Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noon Day Collection. And you can join us here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. Well, today is a very, very, very special episode. It's a standalone episode. As you know, we are in between seasons. Our last season was all about the Enneagram, our special summer launch. I hope that you've had a chance to go listen to that. It's a three-part series where we sat down with nine different Enneagram types at one table, and it was a fascinating conversation. So I encourage you to go check that out. We're going to be launching our new season in September. But until then, Noonday has had some really, really big news. I hope you've seen it. If you haven't yet, let me just give you the 101. Seiko Designs and the founder of Seiko Designs, Liz Bohannon, have merged under the global brand of Noonday Collection as one global family. Seiko Design's mission has always and will always be that every single girl deserves to learn and to lead. Liz Bohannon has been a longtime friend of mine. We have kept in touch as entrepreneurs, as working moms over the last decade. And it became clear just a few months ago, I reached out to Liz and said, what's going on? Maybe it's time for us to learn how we might collaborate. We really didn't exactly know how it would go. But as time went on, it became clear that the best decision to support all of our artisan partners and our mission was to merge under Noonday Collection. And so the last few months have been super exhilarating. They've reminded me of startup days so much decision making and we have now launched our collection that thankfully now includes an incredible wardrobe collection bags accessories home goods we are now a one-stop ethical shop for anything that you would want for yourself or anyone else in your life Some of my favorites so far in our new collection are the magic pants. You've got to go check them out. They're the kind of pants that can sit in your closet for years to come because they magically fit fit me at least. Pre-vacation and post-vacation, where when I tend to, you know, drink too many margaritas and gain a little bit of weight, they do not wrinkle and they also are super comfortable even in the Texas heat. So That is one of my favorites. Some of my other favorites are these gorgeous ceramic earrings. And right now is the time to go pull up the noondaycollection.com site and check it all out. So Liz and I are both having each other on our shows right now. And her show is called Plucking Up. It's an incredible podcast that I have listened to for a long time now. And you can go check out her podcast. It is called Plucking Up. Her book is called Beginner's Pluck. Liz is a Forbes top 20 speaker. She's the founder of Seiko Designs. And now she is the chief growth officer of Noonday Collection, as well as Travis and I's new business partner, as we build a big, big table that we want you to be sitting at. Here's Liz. Welcome, Liz. Welcome, Jessica. <laughs> so actually, Liz, I'm just remembering this is not your first time. We're we're hosting this on both of our podcasts, but you've actually been on Going Scared before. I have many years ago. I think we were both speaking at the Fair Trade Federation conference and it happened to be in Austin. And so we got together and we hung out. We did your podcast. I also remember we went to the after party together. Yes. I came over to your house. Oh, yes. Yeah. I this is many years ago. What, like three or four years ago? Probably three or four years ago. I remember yeah. hanging out thinking, I love this person so much. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. I think I remember similarly. And that's what makes this so great and why people keep saying, like, is this working? Is this working? And I'm like, <laughs> I love working with Liz. <laughs> and I was just telling, and I told you this the other day, I said, it's really cool So 12, I'm 12 years in, you're 12 years in, 13 Mm -hmm. years in to having started a business. And 
let's just talk about the growth. <laughs> let's talk about the leadership <laughs> growth that has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> to Wait, still be doing something, to still be doing something in the world. I mean, Jessica, I don't know if I know anybody. I might be exaggerating right now. I'm not sure off the top of my head I could think of someone that I know that is 13 years in to doing something that they started 13 years ago. Yeah. Like, you know, there's the Mile High Club. <laughs> I feel like we're in the 13, the 12 High Club. The 12 um, High Club. The 12 yeah, High Club. Yeah, but like even a decade, honestly, a decade. I think I know people who maybe have had the same job for a decade, but I don't know anybody who founded a company who 10 years in is still running that company. Still Do you? going strong. I mean, I'm sure I could think of them, but they're probably like well-known, you know, I'm like, Tom's. I mean, Blake is still going at it. You know, Kendra Scott, she's still going at it. But I mean, if we're talking more of Personal privately brands. held companies. Privately held, yeah. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. nothing's coming to mind. And I want to know, this is what I want to know. When you think back to who you were then as a leader and who you are now, what have been some of the big turning points for you where you were like, I need to change because how I'm being experienced is impacting others. And I need to grow in this way and I need to change in this way in order to evolve into a better leader. I'm super curious. Mm. Well, I've been pretty great since the beginning. So that's <laughs> <laughs> perfect in every way. <laughs> Your podcast you know. is called Going Scared. Mine's called Plucking Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's been so many things. You know, I would say probably three ish years in one. And I mean, I'm just trying to go back into the archives, but I would say one of my earliest leadership revelations was kind of around understanding the difference between the what, the why, and the how. Hmm. And realizing, so I'm a very, I'm sure you've experienced this in me, even 13 years in, I have really- in live <laughs> feedback on the show, guys. <laughs> Only an Enneagram 8 would do that. Enneagram 8s, you're like, give me the feedback. What's the feedback? Thanks for the feedback. And I'm a 7 and I'm like, I'm sorry. Did I hurt your feelings? Okay. Yeah, go for it. Tell me. <laughs> You know, I well, I have very strong opinions on things. I, I typically just naturally have a, a perspective and a point of view. And I hold I can hold to things naturally really tightly of just like, no, I think this is why we have to do this. This is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna do it. And I I mean, honestly, it kind of boils down to realizing that as a leader, you need to choose your battles. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like if if you consider everything important to do in the way that you think it should be done, you're going to lose effectiveness as a leader. People will stop listening to you. They will stop uh, believing you when you say, no, 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 no. Like, you know, I have a, I have a friend. She's one of my best friends. <laughs> I'm going to make fun of her on this show publicly because I've I've done this to her in person. But she got married and oh my gosh, it was such a fun wedding. She did an incredible job. It was very orchestrated. All of these like amazingly fun, interesting things, but she considered herself a very low key bride. And this was the opposite of a low key <laughs> wedding. Like just literally nothing about it was low key in the slightest. And every time she brought a new idea to us of like, okay, now you have to go get a pair of these very specific white high top shoes so that in the reception at this very specific moment, we can pick up our very expensive specific dresses that we got that matched our very specific floral head pieces <laughs> that we were wearing. But every time she brought a new idea, she'd be like, no, 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 I'm like super low key. This is the one one thing that I actually care about. You're right. And you're like, okay, you've said that 13 times now. You've lost credibility. You're not a low-key bride and that's fine, but let's call it what it is. The point being, if as a leader, everything in your way and your perspective on every single item is so important, you're going to lose credibility and you're going to lose effectiveness and you're going to build an organization that actually isn't uh, innovative, creative. It's not going to evolve because it's only going to be your perspective that you have to welcome other ideas in. You have to stay super curious. But I struggled in the beginning to know what those things were. Like, 
mm-hmm. where, because I don't want to just be like willy nilly and take everybody's ideas. And like, we have to focus and we have to like have a unique value proposition. And so for me, kind of asking, is this a why, a what, or a how was mm-hmm. really, really super helpful. And realizing that holding on to the why and being pretty militant about our mission, our vision, our unique proposition was actually my responsibility as a leader to know what that was and to hold on to that. But then to recognize that the hows and the whats actually I needed to be more open-handed with and that that was okay to let other people into those things, to stay super curious, to take other people's leads or perspectives, et cetera. I love that. It, it's interesting in the story that you just gave, I would say for me, it's similar to the bride where she had one perception of herself and how she was being perceived, but it was very different on how she was occurring for other people. Mm -hmm. And that my, I mean, obviously there's been so many along the way, including very many just in the last couple months. (laughs) Let's just say (laughs) that if either you and I write another book, let's just say we know that we're, we're in the middle of book material right now. We are, man. We are. Every now and then my agent reaches out. He's like, so when's that second book coming? And I'm like, it's being written. Okay. It's like, (laughs) I am living it. Life is being lived, but it's going to be written. (laughs) <laughs> but that has been so much of me is I I can actually super relate to that bride where I feel like I am this, you know, very encouraging, create space for people to be creative and I want to know your dreams and I want to see you fly. But actually, when I've gotten feedback from the team, something I have to be careful about is that I can be perceived as hyper, rigid, and critical. Mm. So when I'm coming from that place of stress, I'm like a little bit like that bride where it's like at 10 o'clock, you know, it's going to be this. and it. But inside, it's like I'm having more of this creative vision, but then I can get very rigid about that vision and then realize that I'm actually not posturing myself in a way that is creating space for people Mm. to just add to the pool of common meaning. Mm -hmm. Like, no, just bring in. In fact, today we're doing our buy that you have been a part of to purchase our spring jewelry collection. We're doing wardrobe and um, bags, accessories, all of those things on kind of another calendar. But today is the jewelry buy. And I, you know, I've been like ideating on it. You and I did it. We took it to the gram. We got the polls and I put together the collection this morning and then I'm presenting to the team. But the team then goes back and looks at costs and artisan allocation and carryover and inventory levels and all of this other stuff. So I had to be careful to not be like, and here's the decision. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what I've decided and this is what it's going to be. Instead, it was like, here is a selection. Here's my perspective on that. I know that there's so much that goes into decision-making around this process, and I cannot wait to hear your ideation and your ideas at the end of the day because now they're kind of in there, you know, figuring all this out, and I'm realizing I have to be Mm open-handed to, okay, that's not going to make it because it just doesn't make sense for this line or whatever. So so it's just – it's interesting. How do you think you – are perceived as opposed to how you, like, when has there been a disconnect when you're like, I'm occurring to you for like that? I know there was something recently where I was like, you get your idioms wrong, just like me. And you were like, uh, mm -mm, that is not, (laughs) (laughs) no, don't put that on me, Jess. That's on you. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. I was like, maybe every once in a while, but I actually feel pretty confident in my idiom use. Um, What would be, I mean, maybe, honestly, Jess, I feel like at dinner the other night, I don't perceive myself to be super controlling or type A. I my my perception of myself is that if I care about something, I care about it super, super, super deeply. And then I am very impassioned about it. Like what I just said. However, I perceive myself to be someone who like considers eight out of ten things that come up in like normal everyday life. I I actually feel super flexible and open with. There's a misconception about eights that we are controlling. 
what's actually more true is that we don't want to be controlled. So mm. it's like when we sense that someone else is trying to control us, that's like super triggering. And so I, that's how I identify of like when I, the two out of 10 things, I'm like, this is a hill I will die on. And then the eight, but eight out of 10 things, I'm like pretty loosey goosey go with the flow. And, but I said that at dinner and you kind of reacted a little bit like, that's not how I perceive you to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Okay. So. But you know what I think it is? Because you said, you know, there's like two out of 10. Mm-hmm. But we've been probably dealing with 50 decisions a day that yeah. all feel big. And yeah. so it's probably been, you know, instead it's been like, okay, there's, you know, 10 out of 40 decisions and maybe those have felt big to me. You right. Know? They've been like a uh, misproportioned of the actual really important things. Maybe we haven't experienced each other as much in the day to day where it's like, okay, yeah, I'm super open to that. Like, I feel like it's pretty easy for me if I think someone is better at something than me or more of an expert or has thought about something longer or harder, unless it's one of those two out of 10, I generally feel it's quite easy for me to go like, defaulting to you in that. Like trust yeah, your instinct, yeah. run with I it. I can and do so- that too. I feel like that's why we work really well together. I mean, considering we jumped into the deep end, shotgun wedding. <laughs> shotgun <laughs> wedding for sure. But, you know, when I do think about how we've jumped into the deep end together and have been in so many high stakes conversations and also, you know, what I, the feedback I've gotten in the past is like, it, it's it's very similar to you. It's like, there are so many things I'm flexible about, but then you get into my sandbox and I'm yeah. like, uh-uh, that is my mm-hmm. toy. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like the mm-hmm. three-year-old, you know, I'm like, that's my toy. And obviously I, I've had a business partner for 12 years who is also an Enneagram 8. So we've had to work through a lot of those dynamics. And what I was telling a friend the other day is like, this is the, it's so refreshing and great to have a new business partner and really a new friend also that I'm getting to meet during this phase of my life where I've mm. done so much yeah. work. Yeah. You know, where I really can't where clarity is kindness and you know, we got into this intense what felt intense to me. Um whatever feels intense to me probably feels less intense to you just because of of your eightness, but <laughs> it was you me and our marketing Uh, manager Becca was in the car and we were having this intense discussion about how to actually publicly say the merger, you Mm -hmm. know, and like what day it should be on and like whose email and all of that. And it was, it was a very sharp and direct conversation. And in the past that would have felt, I I probably would have lost sleep over it that night. Mm. And instead it was like, you're being clear. I'm being clear. We're both getting to the bottom end, to the end. And then we got to the end and felt really great. And like, I really didn't think about it after that, except that I did circle back to Beck and go, are you okay? Because that was kind of intense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did that feel intense to you? It did. Yeah. That actually did feel intense to me. I was feeling, I think in that specific conversation was feeling a little bit misunderstood, I think. Um, And then I feel like I said that and I spoke up very directly with the way in which I wasn't feeling heard because it wasn't, it wasn't actually just like a super logistical conversation. It was touching into kind of some more, I think, emotional things, Uh but I felt like I was able to really directly say that to you of like, I'm not feeling heard. I'm not feeling understood. I need to share. And I feel like you really received that and heard me and I felt really great about it. And then I feel like we were able to kind of get back on the same page, solve the logistical Mm. issue. Because here's the thing, logistics never get spicy unless there's something a little bit under, right? Like if it's actually about the date an email goes out, really hard for that to get spicy. Usually my experience is, I should not say never because we don't say those words, but my my experience is typically it's like, oh, there's something probably one layer under there. And in that conversation there was where I was like feeling pretty unheard, but I felt like I was able to say that really directly that you responded and heard and that we were able to get back on the same page. And then go have a great dinner together. And I really value like fast repair Uh is super 
trust building Gosh, for me. Gosh, it is. I mean, can we just talk about repair time for marriages? I mean, it used to be mm-hmm. Joe and I in those mm-hmm. early years. It would take like five days. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And now what used to take us five days can take us five minutes. Mm-hmm. Isn't that beautiful? It is. I love that. But it takes – gosh, the effort – it just takes a lot of effort to get to that place. And I think that's what makes this so healthy between you and me is that we've had to do so much work in our marriages, in our leadership, yes. in our parenting. And because we've done the work, I'm just going to brag on us. We've done the work. Like this yeah. stuff doesn't – there's highly dysfunctional leaders that exist because they aren't doing the work. They mm. aren't becoming self-aware, going to therapy, going through the coaching programs, um, reading the books, listening to Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. Come on, (laughs) just listen to that and apply it and you're going to be a good leader. Being in friendship, Jess, I think one of the things that served us both so well is we both are so wildly committed to very authentic, committed female friendships outside of work. that is accurate. So we have both for both have that. literal decades now have cultivated relationships where we are – we ask for feedback. We hear feedback. We have to receive that feedback. We move forward. We repair. We reconcile. We show up better, stronger, more intimate, and more connected. And that, I deeply believe, has prepared me – even for this specific relationship, Jess, I, I mean – Ian, we've had people say this. It's just like, there's no way this is going to work. Like, because our, it's not just two company, any merger is tough. Mm-hmm. Our industry, like our companies are very driven by yes. us as individuals, by our personalities, by mm-hmm. our culture. Um, and so to merge those two communities together, I mean, for the most part, the, the responses that I've gotten has been like, woo that's going to be interesting. Like two big personalities trying to share the stage. And it it's really reminiscent to me of like, I lived with six girls in college. And so often I feel like people would hear that and be like, oh my gosh, six women in one house. And it would always make me so angry because I was like, yeah, six women in one house. It's plucking awesome. Yeah. Like these are the best, you know, years of my life. And we were very much so even in college. It was like Monday night family meetings where we sat around in a circle and we shared our hearts and where we were at and what we were struggling with. And it was our safe time and space to provide feedback from one another of just like on a weekly basis, we are going to come expecting that we've hurt one another, expecting that we're missing the mark, expecting that we're disappointing each other. And there's a safe place for us to raise our hand and go, gosh, you know, when you, whatever roommate thing, you know, threw my eggs away, <laughs> like, la- you know, whatever it was, or like you're. Oh, like- my roommates called me out because I never bought junk food, but then I would like sneak theirs. <laughs> it was like, came from my weird, <laughs> stupid dieting past, you know? And so every now and then, and I still have shame to this to this day. I can't believe I'm saying it out loud. I would like go to sneak a Cheeto and there would be like a post-it note that was like, no, please. Hands it off didn't, my I don't Cheetos know if they said dish. my name, but we all knew like. Please do not take my Cheeto. <laughs> so funny. That's me at every restaurant ever. I'm like, no, I don't need the large fry. And then Ben orders it and then I eat 75% of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but true. I mean, honestly, those things might sound silly, but it's just a muscle. Like it is, it a, is muscle a muscle of showing up, of expecting you're not perfect, of knowing that in love, because there's a huge difference for sure between getting feedback that just feels critical And getting feedback when, like, for instance, this just happened in my marriage yesterday. I got some feedback and it felt really hard to me because I'm feeling like my partner has a story about me that they actually want to be true. And so then the feedback kind of feels like I have this bias against you. And so I'm going to, you're going to do something. And then I'm like reading it through this bias and I'm just discouraged where I'm just like, man, I'm trying so hard. And I feel like you actually don't want this to get better. So you're, you're looking not for the wins. It feels like you're looking for when I'm failing and that's just really discouraging and hard. And so I I say all of that to say like feedback still super hard for me to get in certain, you know, if I feel like it's like, I just can't win or if it's something you've been working on or... Yeah, You know what? My marriage therapist, or he's my therapist, but he told me something so accurate, and I have to say it's also true for business too. 
He said the issues that come up in the first few months of your marriage are going to be the same thing that you are working on 30 and 40 years later. Yeah, sounds about right. (laughs) You know, and I can absolutely say that. I mean, Travis and I just had some stuff come up last week and the stuff is like it hadn't come up in a while because we hadn't been under just like an extreme stress like the merger. And I, I have to say, I was like, this is like, I was like reflecting on it to Joe, my husband. And he's like, oh yeah, that's, that's like exactly what y'all it even went to executive coaching for to begin with five years ago, you yeah. know? Yep. <laughs> and it was like, yep. yeah, we've been around. It's interesting the things that come up during stress. And I think that's what's so important to 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 kind of identify when everyone's in a place of stress and to be able to own what's going on in your own life. And, you know, because that tends to be what brings turns the heat up. And when the heat's turned up, we go back to our old patterns of being. Totally. Which is so important to remember that that isn't so a lie that I have believed and still believe to this day. And I I intellectually don't believe it anymore, but my body can't let go of this truth, is that people's true self comes out when they're stressed, angry, or afraid. So I'm, and I've shared this with you definitely, and probably a lot of people listening to the show know this, but I am married to someone, we both just run super hot. We're very community, like we, we are not passive. So nothing gets thought without being said. And that's kind of in some ways amazing and beautiful because we talk about everything and we communicate and you always know kind of not always, but you often, you usually know where we're at and what we're getting. The hard part about that is there's a lot that comes out of your mouth and my belief from my partner is like, oh, and in his moments of anger, when he does say sometimes some really hurtful things, my narrative that I believe is like, that's your true belief about me. And it just came out in this moment. And, you know, the 99 other things that you've said to me over the last month in kindness, when you weren't stressed out, when you weren't angry, when you weren't afraid, mm, that was all kind of lip service. And this one thing that you said to me when you were triggered, that's it. That's your true belief about me. Mm. And then I'm devastated because I'm like, my partner thinks this kind of horrible thing about me. And then it causes you to look back on your whole past month and recolor it all. Like all those times I thought were great, actually, you were resenting me. Totally. And what our therapist has been great about reminding me of is she's like, oh, Liz, Ben's like when he's flooded or when you're flooded, anybody, it's not just Ben, it's all humans. When you're flooded with anger or fear, your that part of your brain that is actually the highest functioning part of your brain completely shuts off. And you are operating out of your lowest, least true, least intellectually sound place in those moments. And so it's totally flipped that it's like, no, no, My no. My coach his- calls it an amygdala fight. My yeah, executive coach. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. like, "Oh, you and your partner just your your amygdalas just had a fight together." <laughs> oh, I love that. I want to like little. I want like little figurines that are just both of our amygdalas with little some reptiles. like reptiles. She calls it it's yes. the reptile brain. It's your lizard brain. Yeah, your little absolutely. lizards. Your lizards are having a fight, <laughs> and you're not even gonna remember what you. you I, I often can't even remember when my amygdala is having a fight. I can't even remember exactly what I said because it's my totally. reptile brain. It's I dumb. Black out. I I don't even know if you know this yet, Jess but this will probably come up now in our merged communities. I call it my gecko. So you'll hear, you'll even hear ambassadors, former Seiko fellows talk about my gecko said this, my gecko is doing that. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Uh my lizard brain in a moment of fear, frustration, anger, rejection. This is what my gecko was telling me, or this is what my gecko is saying. And, and that's where that comes from is kind of like the lizard brain And so for me, it's really been have in the moment, I have to reframe and go like, that's not his truest truth. But that's hard. That's been a hard thing for me to rewire because I think as a culture and a society, we do. It's like, oh, in a moment of, you know, in a moment of anger, the real truth came out. And it's like, "Mm, actually, from a psychological, physiological perspective, that's actually not true. That's That's not when the most truth happens and emerges. But it takes a lot of work for me, even still today. I've known that piece of science for however many years. And like I said, my head can believe it, but my body still kind of holds on to that of like, I think that's what you really believe about me. And that can be really sad and hard. But all that being said, I really do feel like to circle back, maybe I'm misattributing this, but I really do think because we have both really pursued those types of relationships outside of business, specifically with other strong women, that I think we just, it's, I believe it has 
served us so well. And it feels like such a gift to me to show up. And like, I want to go out to every single one of your friends, Jess, and be like, who have loved you, who have challenged you, who have walked alongside of you, who have been committed, who have held your hard things, who have celebrated your joys with you. And I almost want to be like, thank you. Thank you Mm. for setting the stage. You inadvertently served me so well. And now I'm stepping into this relationship that could take like 30 seconds to go up in flames, honestly, with all of the risk profiles that we have merging these communities and big personalities and egos and fear and all of that stuff, like, and be like, oh, there's so much work that's been done here that now we both get to benefit from as we well, step and then into what's this so new cool season. so too is as, and thank you for saying that, um, at my, you know, I, I talk about my therapist a lot on the show. I've had him on the show. We, he, we did a whole series around fear and anxiety back in December of 21. He's an interpersonal neurobiologist. So all of his work is really around how we are not just individuals in the world. We are only mm. like the sum of our, the people in our lives. And when I first met him a few years ago at a conference, and I um, was in a bad place with one of my kids who would go into flight, fright, flight, or freeze, and he would go into freeze, and mm. freeze for me is very triggering because I feel abandoned. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I was not responding well. And I was like, not the adult in the relationship. And I think the kid at the time was like seven years old, you know? So it was like, somebody needs to grow up and it's not going to be my seven year old. So what are we going to do here? Um, and so I just, I, I remember just like telling him like, oh my God, this happened. And this is how I, how I reacted to my poor kid. And he just said, wow, it sounds like God brought him into your life to heal you because deep calls to deep. And it's cool to think about you and I, and it's like, God brought you into my life. There's going to be stuff that emerges now because of partnering with you that God is like, I want to bring that to wholeness. I want to evolve that piece of you so that you can even show up more whole and loving in the world. And it's just, I don't know. It's just really cool. It's really cool. Okay. So what are some things that, you know, as we look into our future, now that this is out there, you know, it's been about a week. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm excited about <laughs> is we are selling some amazing items and they are selling like hotcakes. So getting sales numbers in now that we are together and just like, oh, this is good. This is so good. I mean, everyone everyone on my podcast knows because I'm so transparent. I'm overly transparent, you know, that we have been on the low part of the S curve at noonday for the last couple of years. And, um, it's like, oh my God, this is not fun to run a business when it's declining. And I'm like, oh my God, we're not declining anymore. We're actually going up again. So that feels really good. I'll Um, never forget Jess the day you walked in. So it was the first day that Seiko Fellows could sign up or kind of open up their businesses in in the noonday back office. So not to get too technical, but it was kind of like day one where that was even a possibility, where the the great migration, if you will, was actually the great taking migration. place. And um, w- we were at the Austin offices, and I was in the design or in the marketing room working on something. And you walked in, and you had the numbers of how many Seiko Fellows had had migrated. And you just started crying. And we like had this really sweet hug. You Mm. also picked me up. I remember that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it was just like such a sweet moment, I think, for both of us because, you know, we're both, we can, we are, we know what we believe in a lot of ways and we have these strong perspectives and strong voices. And so I do think that sometimes people can perceive, at least me, and I would imagine it's the same as you, of just like, and I've had people say this to me before, of just like, you're just so fearless, that Mm -hmm. word of just like, how are you so fearless? And whenever somebody says that to me, I'm just shocked because I'm just like, oh no, I'm mainly scared all of the time. (laughs) Like (laughs) I am mainly walking around terrified most of the time. And have I gotten to a point where I refuse to let my fear ha- take the driver's seat? Yeah, actually the, the vast majority of the time because I've I've built up the experience and the muscle memory to trust and believe that just because I'm afraid doesn't mean I'm doing something wrong. It means I'm doing something unknown. And But I think for both of us probably, 
there's a lot of fear going into this. Like when people say, hey, there's an 85% chance this isn't going to work, you would almost have to be a sociopath to not be afraid of it, right? Like right. these <laughs> these two things that we have both poured our life and heart and soul and mind and energy into to say, I'm deeply believing that actually the best is yet to come, but it's on the other side of a huge risk of this all falling apart yeah. is terrifying. And yeah. so I think like for both of us in that moment to kind of have this sense of like celebration, relief, excitement of just like, oh, everything that we very confidently hoped for and worked towards and had intellectual reason to believe was going to work, but we're still scared and it's still risk. And like, it may look big and fancy, or maybe you don't see it until we're on the other side of it. But I don't know. I guess I just want to take a moment to kind of peel the curtains back and to say like, but make no mistake, we were both terrified. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, like we were. In fact, I even told, I was telling someone back in like February, I was like, I feel like Abraham right now because I feel like the best is yet to come. And yet the, there is like clear evidence that it is falling off of a cliff. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. I don't think I've told you the full story. And this goes back to how you and I both connected around like once you like – when someone hears something once, the, that's the person that gets the best of you. Because yes, yes. after that, you're like, don't have the patience to explain yes. it again. And I'm I think like, this I'm whole bored. Time, this whole time, I've been like, oh, I'll tell you this someday. So why not live on the podcast why for not? thousands of other people to it. hear? Okay. So last August, you know, we had to do a, like a, a fairly large layoff. It was just really, really challenging. 2021 was just like, what is happening? 2020, we were like, we got through 2020 and it was amazing. And then it was like, oh my God, this is not working. You know, artisans are having to lay off people. It was, it was a very, very challenging time. Um, really where I just went into a huge place of discouragement, disappointment, grief, and really dealing with grief healthily for the first time in my life, like actually naming it. And right before we were going to actually have to to have this conversation around layoffs, uh, Jalia sent me a photo. And the photo was extremely significant because it was just six years ago where I had been, maybe actually it was, it was in 2017, I had gone to be with Jalia in Uganda and we, she was showing me her farm for the first time, which is extremely significant because when I met her, she was homeless and didn't have a computer or a bank account. And now she has this farm that Noonday Collection Orders have been able to enable her to do so that she can grow vegetables and fruit to supply to her whole entire community. So she's walking me around this farm, showing me like we were eating passion fruit and av avocados and sugar cane. And she was like, we're going to plant an avocado tree together. And we're going to take this seed and we're going to remember this moment. And so she had this whole avocado seed prepared. It had already been sprouted. We've got the hose. We're put, we're like digging in. And I'm thinking it is a significant moment in time, but I'm not actually thinking that that seed is going to grow into a tree because I grew up in an urban environment where I really, I truly did not believe that seeds grew into things. I thought like all of our food comes from a lot. <laughs> it's an urban legend, right? So we plant this, this seed together. And, you know, I, I even wrote about it in my book. It was like the final chapter. And I'm like, so we planted a seed. So the day before we were making this devastating announcement and conversation, mm. and I'm thinking, oh, great. Everything was just false. You know, I said mm. that we were building this beautiful thing and it's actually done dying or whatever. And she goes, Jessica, look at our avocado tree. And she sends me a photo and it is a huge tree producing beautiful avocados. And so that came to me at just a moment where I thought, okay, I'm still going to believe. So fast forward to January and this gets a little spiritual. And sometimes my podcast listeners are like, where are you taking me, Jess? So I, sometimes I share my faith. Sometimes I don't. This is one of those situations where I do. So I'm I'm getting prayer from a couple that I've never met in my life at my church. And it was, again, it was like January. Things are, nothing's changed, right? <laughs> it's like, so this is, this, Jan, this is Jan 2022. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. just a handful of months ago. 
And I'm like, okay, I've got the, at this point, I've got the photo of the the tree, the avocado tree on my iPhone. I'm like going to believe that, yes, that someday we're going to produce fruit and things are still not good. And so I asked this young couple from my church, actually they're Indian and my Indian friends know how to pray like nobody's business. So I was doing so bad. I was like, I'm going to get them to pray for me. (laughs) So they're praying for me and um, just said a lot of beautiful and affirming things. And then the woman just said, I just want you to know the fruit's coming. There is, Noonday is like a tree. Wow. And right now it's been sparse and you haven't seen any fruit. I want you to know the fruit is coming. And I pulled up my iPhone and was like, what? Are you serious? And it kept being abysmal. But I, but that moment was like this. I'm going to believe that the best is yet to come. And I bought a journal that said the best is yet to come. I, I went to Amani Collective, which has this cute little like embroidered thing that's like the best is yet to come. And I hung it up in my bathroom. And I had no idea it was you. Mm. Like it was you. Jasmine. And the fruit, like we are, now we're growing this tree. And I say that, you know, we're shade builders. We're getting to build a tree together. And I even remember actually in March, this is before we even spoke. I was in California in the wine country and there were a lot of orchards and such. And someone was explaining how, how the same apple tree can grow two different kinds of apples. And Mm. I think that's even what gave me this vision of like, what if we're meant to like merge with other companies? And it's like, it's this one tree, but there's like, you can pull a gala off apple off the same tree. You can pull a, Mm. I don't know, any other apple types. (laughs) Honey Chris. Okay. So honey Chris and Kayla can grow at the same tree and the same. And it was you. And so that that's a story I wanted to share, the full story. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's even so, I mean, that's kind of like hashtag the best is yet to come. I feel right. like I didn't know that was your thing. And that's the language that I've been using, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is just so, so sweet to see those ways in which our paths were probably in that very cosmic woohoo way, like passing and crossing one another. Um, and you just, you just never know, right? You never know. And I think that one of the interesting things about our story, just that probably for an outsider is like, I mean, I don't think because we both believe very deeply in community and in collaboration over competition, I don't think either of us would have been like noon day as a competitor, Seiko is a competitor, use that language, but just purely, purely, purely from like a business standpoint, we were absolutely competitors, right? Similar product categories, similar models. Like we were the two biggest fair trade fashion, social selling companies. So just from a pure, pure on paper, very much so like we were one another's biggest competitors. And I think it's like a very good reminder of just like you, I mean, honestly, not to make it too trite or like, but you just never know, right? Like treat every person in your life. What if we walked around treating every person in our life going like, well, what if that's a future business partner or bestie (laughs) that I I don't know yet, you know? And just like, and just with, with a sense of, um, care. And I mean, I, I know I shared this moment with you, but only with our internal community that I don't even know when this was, but just like several years ago. So I have a, I have a rule on social media. I call it my three strikes rule that if I follow somebody on social media and I have a quote unquote negative feeling, so whatever, it makes me feel bad. It makes me feel ashamed. It makes me feel not enough. I feel jealous. I feel afraid, whatever it is. I just pay attention to those emotions. And I, the first time I'm like, okay, maybe that was just like a random thing. Then if it happens a second time, I'm like, okay, take note. And if it happens a third time, I give myself a choice. And I say, you either, for whatever reason, this person isn't serving you, Um, And I, I, you know, I like to tell people that it's just like, you get to be in control. Like you are the boss of your inputs. You are, there are some relationships that you can't escape from. You know, when you're, Jess, you were sharing about your seven-year-old who is triggering you. Okay. Well, those are kind of situations where you just got to lean in and figure that out. But like someone you follow on social media, like, can we all just say, 
you're in control Use your of that mute little button, people. Use, use your mute, mute button. And and so for me, I give myself two choices. I'm like either unfollow and I unfollow willy nilly all the time. I'm just like, boop, unfollow. Don't feel bad about it. This isn't serving me for whatever reason. I'm very, very free with curating my input because I'm, I am the boss of my brain and of cultivating like a strong, creative, open mind. And if something's not serving me, beep, unfollow. But my other choice is if I don't want to unfollow that I commit to praying for that person and ask God to bless them to, you know, like that I could learn from them, whatever it is, whatever that kind of like unique situation is. And, um, so I'm like, unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. And then I came across and I can't, it's been too long. I can't remember the kind of why or what, but I just remember being like, nope, not going to unfollow what you are going to do is you're going to pray. And here is a woman in the world who is running fast and who is running hard and like her values and her mission and what she is building is literally building the world that you want to live in. We're not going to unfollow. We are going to commit. And I can't remember for how long it was. I mean, it definitely wasn't like the last four years. I wish I could say that. But there was a season where it was like every time I came across your name, on social media or elsewhere, it became almost like muscle memory to just be like, oh my gosh, God, will you bless Jessica? Will you make everything that she touches turn into gold? (laughs) Will you make this mission and this vision flourish? Will you create jobs? Will you create impact? Will you give them favor? And you were my biggest competitor, (laughs) you know, like that was, um, it's a weird thing, but also, and I, I think it would have been a beautiful thing regardless of how the story ended up. But for me, it becomes extra special to go, oh my gosh, all that time you had in your wildest dreams, you didn't realize that this community that you had been holding up and praying for and, you know, wanting and wishing the best for, would actually many, many, many years later become your family and your community and your business partner. Um, and just to like, th- those are the kind of like, mm-hmm. I have goosebumps right now. Totally, of just me too. This like w- cosmic way in which we are, like and we we've belong been choosing to each that. other. And it takes intention. I mean, I've had you on my podcast before. That was super intentional. I mm-hmm. literally hosted a competitor on my podcast, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and that was intentional because it was like you were here for the Fair Trade Federation. I mean, that's what's amazing. I mean, y'all, in in the world of retail, no one shares each other's sources with each other. Everything is top secret. Everything is very veiled. I mean, that's why we are where we are today. People are like, what? I want to know where my clothes are made. I want to know where my jewelry comes from. And I was like, you know what? In the spirit of fair trade partnership, Mm. I am going to host a competitor on my show, you know? (laughs) Yep, yep, yep. And those are the things where it's just like, I think it's easy to show up and on day one, it's, you know, like, I don't know, everybody has like a coffee mug or like a t-shirt, like, you know, choose collaboration over competition. But actually when it comes down to it, those aren't, you don't just like wake up and be like, I'm going to do this. Like this is a million choices. It's a million, a million tiny choices of how you're going to show up in the world. Are you going to operate out of a belief of scarcity, which I will just say up front and in a lot of different ways, I can tend to operate. My natural inclination can be one of fear and scarcity. And it has taken a lot of work in in a lot of areas of my life to show up and to say, I don't believe that's the truth. I'm going to live out of a story of abundance and um, choose collaboration and choose generosity and choose honesty and choose transparency um, with the belief that there is enough to your point, we don't just wake up and go like, oh, huge, here's a huge opportunity on the horizon. All of a sudden, I'm going to believe in community over competition. It's actually like, oh, no, I made 10,000 and you made 10,000 tiny decisions. Again, not even just in the context of our businesses, but like just the muscles that we're building for how we show up in the world so that when those opportunities present themselves, it's like, oh, you've been in the gym. It's possible. Like that yeah. muscle is that muscle has been built. And that's not to say there's a lot of work ahead of us. I know there is. Like I know that there will be challenging moments and things that trigger one another and all of these things. Like we're entering into a new season of unknown. And I'm pretty clear-eyed about knowing that there are challenges ahead, but also going like, oh, but we've been building this muscle for so many years. And now we get to benefit from the fruit of that. It's posturing ourselves towards possibility 
and just mm. being aware of that scarcity. Okay, everyone's listening now and they're like, whoa, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> like if you're just like, okay, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Like I want to learn what a life, what it means to have a posture of possibility. I want to know what it means to be a part of a community that's being led by people, by women that are saying, I am, I just laughed at myself when I, women, women, <laughs> um, <laughs> all my podcast listeners are very super used to the way that I say, uh, women. And so Liz, why do people need to join us right now and how can they do that? Oh my gosh. Well, there's a couple reasons that you need to join us. First, I'm going to speak to the you in the equation, not you, Jess. You are listeners of like, well, what's in it for you? I will say, um, one, what we're talking about right now, this sense of community. And I know that you've heard the same thing thousands of times that I've heard that, that what we have created collectively together in our communities is a place of connection of inspiration, of possibility, of collaboration, of deep friendship, of adventure, of purpose and meaning and impact. It's just a table. It is a big, beautiful table where we're saying like, hey, if you care about creating dignified opportunities for our brothers and sisters across the globe, and if you care and you believe that every girl should have the opportunity to learn and to lead regardless of where she was born, what she looks like, the family that she was born into, the culture, what it says about her and her worth and her possibility. If you believe that every girl has should have the opportunity to learn and to lead, come sit at the table with us. If you are in a place where you are excited about the possibility of some flexible income. And what mm -hmm. flexible means, by the way, is not that you're not going to have to work because work is work and you will never hear Jess or I be like, no, just sign up and you're going to become a millionaire in your sleep. Like, okay, <laughs> hard pass. No, you're going to have to work. Um, but you work on your own time to your own schedule in a way that absolutely can fit with the rhythms and the seasons of your life and make a really meaningful difference in your family's financial life and existence, uh, depending on how much of a priority you want to make it there is a seat at the table for you. If you love fashion and you're like, listen, I could buy all the things, handbags, jewelry, clothes, sign me up. But like, mama's got a budget. This is an incredible opportunity to build a full sustainable wardrobe and lifestyle at a serious discount. Join us. And then there's the meta picture, right? Um, it has always been important to create dignified fair wage jobs. It is always been important to create opportunity for female scholars. But specifically over the last 24 months, in the context of COVID, over 100 million people, we have made a lot of progress actually in the last decade. And then a lot of that progress got wiped out over the last two years. 100 million people have been pushed back into extreme poverty. So folks who had worked their way out are back in it. There are 30 million girls who stopped going to school during the pandemic and don't have a line of sight for getting back in the classroom. And so on a meta level, from a mission and vision and impact standpoint, there has literally never been a more important time to engage and to make a difference. And I know, and this is a phrase you use a lot, Jess, of this idea of like compassion fatigue, of just like it's been a brutal few years and it's we can't care about everything in the world. And that's okay. We, I don't think we were meant to carry the world's burdens. But let's not become just numb to the heartache of the world. And if for you, those two things, dignified fair wage jobs and girls going to school, if that makes your heart beat a little bit faster, if that makes you go like, yes, that is the world that I want to live in, but I feel totally overwhelmed. I don't know how to start. The problem seems so big. I want to tell you that Literally, I feel confident in saying this brand promise. Jess, you can stop me if you disagree. We have made it the absolute most fun to do heavy, big, important work, more fun than anybody else in the entire world. <laughs> like if you want right. to make a social justice impact, but you want to have a ball and you want to travel the world and you want to earn money and you want to look great and, and style and meet amazing friends come on. Like, where else are you doing work that is that important that is also freaking fun? Right. So fun. I mean, we're talking, it's, we're, we're having a blast, honestly. It's, it's just incredible. And we want you, we want you. And 
Liz and I have talked a lot about fear today. And, you know, all we want to say is go scared and then pluck up. <laughs> because... <laughs> We were joking about wanting to do a live podcast tour, and we we're like, "What would we call it?" And then we we're like, "Let's call it Plucking Scared." <laughs> plucking Scared, because plucking we're all plucking scared, scared, but we all know that on the other side of our fear is our greatest impact. It's where our greatest relationships wait for us. It's where our greatest purpose is waiting for us, and that's what Liz and I are getting to live into. And we're not some, you know, special snowflake people. We really are just women who decided, you know what. Uh, I, I'm scared, but I know that that I'm meant to use my life to create opportunity for other people. And these other people are now our family and they're all over the world. I mean, we have people in now 13 different countries. We're traveling to Peru, to Ecuador, to Guatemala next year alone. And if you join right now, the earning starts now to get to go on those trips. I know Liz and I are going to be going to some of those places next year. And so you'll get to come with us. It's just, it's just a good time to go ahead and say yes. And I remember when um, the, the very first people that said, hey, why don't you start selling these artisan-made products out of your home? My friends that were living in Uganda, they said, I think you could create a marketplace for these people. And I laughed at them. And I said, my plate is so full. I have so much going on. I've got two kids. I've got another one on the way via adoption. I already have another business that I run. And what can I say? Courage cornered me. We got into a financial bind and I needed a way to have some additional income. And so this was the opportunity that I took. And so sometimes saying yes, even in the middle of those chaotic, fearful, tired, fatigued places, is that's actually the moment when you get to lift up and say, I'm going to stop just binging on Netflix. I'm going to quit just pouring the bottle of wine every single night. Like this is such a good way to do something towards your future self, like the, the future self that you really want to be. And what's crazy about it is that right now it's a dollar. It's literally a dollar. If you're listening to this podcast in August, you can start your own business through Noonday Collection for $1. And we did that to show that we are one now, that we are one. And we wanted to just really create that excitement that this this, this is only going to happen once. A merger with Seiko Designs and Noonday Collection is only going to happen once. And that is what we've done. And we want you to be a part of it. So Join us. You can go to NoondayCollection.com. If you know of an ambassador in your community, you can reach out to her. She would love to talk with you. But you can just go to Noonday and click on Join, and we will walk with you right through it. I also tell people they can always DM me at Jessica Honiger um, on Instagram. And on that note, Liz, Liz, now, now that she has all of these partners, she, I told her that she has to start creating more content on Instagram because she is one of the smartest writers that I know. You're very so sweet. go follow and, Liz. And Jess taught me how to use Instagram over the weekend. I was like, <laughs> wait, insights? How do you see your insights on Instagram? I've never thought to look at that before. So you know what? We each have our strengths that we are bringing to the table, and that includes you. We're building a really, really big, beautiful table. And so whatever your gecko is telling you, I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not stylish enough. I don't have enough friends. I'm not outgoing enough. Blah, 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 blah. I promise you, this is my personal guarantee that if you come take your rightful seat at our table and join our community, that there's a spot for you and that we need you. We need you exactly how you are, whether you're like, I've got 30 minutes a week to give or, hey, I want to make this a full-time thing, whether you feel like you've got experience or this feels super foreign to you. And I will say, just I'm not sure how it is in the Noonday community, but I know in the Seiko community, about 80% of folks who joined had no experience. We're like, I'm not stylish. I've never sold anything in my or life. They didn't I don't have feel their business ears oriented. Pierced, like Liz truly. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, there is a seat at the table for you. Okay. I'm an executive at a company that sells statement earrings and I didn't have my ears pierced until about three weeks ago. It's never too late. You are enough. We need your light, your unique energy, your gifts, your skills, your joys, your sorrows, all of it. We're here for it, and we can't wait to meet you. Well, thank you, Liz. This was really fun. We should do this more. Let's do it. Okay. We're going to come up with some – well, you know we want to – we already have decided we want to be QVC hosts. Oh, yeah. And talk so, show hosts. And, and talk show hosts. So maybe podcast hosts. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows what's in our future? 
This was very fun. It was fun to be kind of a little bit on. I feel like this was a fun merger because usually, I mean, we both are on shows a lot as the guests. And then we both host our own shows where you're very much so the interviewer. This was like kind of twisty wisty and this somewhere in between. He's talking to who? He's and I liked who? it. I don't know. <laughs> Kept me on my toes. Um, <laughs> super fun. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. And who knows? Maybe there'll be more in the future. But until then, stay plucky. What do you say at the end of your podcast? Do you have a sign off? Until then, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. All right. Well, I would love for you specifically to share this episode. As Liz said, we are doing something important. We're doing something that not many people do. I think especially women coming together to build a table together is unique and you're invited. You're invited. And so would you share this episode? You can share it by screenshotting it, putting it on Instagram. You could just text a link to a friend and say, this was really encouraging just to hear about two women and their stories of how they came together. We would love for you to do that. You also can review and rate the podcast. Just head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts, leave a review. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be back better than ever in September. So stay tuned. But in the meantime, share this episode. And until next time, I'll take you by the hand and we'll keep going scared.